Well, good morning, and it's a blessing to be able to share this message with you. This is actually afternoon. Uh, Pastor was going out of town, so we're doing this in a little early. Uh, but I appreciate you all joining us this morning. I'd like to ask you if you would open your Bible to Daniel chapter 2, verses 31 through 46 of what we'll be looking at this morning. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, it is a real privilege to know, Lord, that ultimately you're in control of every circumstance of every day. There's nothing that's going on in this world that, Father, you don't know right now. Father, it's good for us to always remember that this world is not our home. And, Father, that we have much, much more to look forward to. And, Father, to have our real focus upon the things that are in front of us, the things that are eternal. And Father, to really focus on you and your plan and seek to follow your direction day by day that what we do may honor and glorify you in every aspect of our lives. And Father, that by thy grace that we might have opportunity to share the truth of our God, the truth of the only true God. And Father, the joy and the blessing it is to be your child. And the, great, and the great future that we have looking forward to you. Lord, we know that as we look upon these days and the challenges in these days, that Lord, you already knew this before the world, before the world ever was. And Lord, we know that ultimately it's all fitting into your perfect plan. And your perfect purpose. So let us be aware of that. Let us not lose sight that you know us each and individually, and you have a plan for each of our life that we're going through right now. Father, we know that there's hardships out there, people that are having difficult times, financially, physically, uh, many different ways, Lord. Children can be all kinds of issues out there. You know all of those. Spiritually, Lord, most importantly. But we lift them all up to you and ask you to open our hearts here this morning Go before what I say and let it all be from you, Lord, and, and truly your word. And Father, let our hearts be open to your wonderful truth. And we ask all of this in Jesus' name, amen. And we wanna, we're going to continue our study in the book of Daniel here this morning. Our focus is really going to be on the interpretation of Daniel's, of Nebuchadnezzar's dream. You know, in our last study, we saw how the secret was revealed unto Daniel of Nebuchadnezzar's dream. As we saw in, in, on, in verse 19 of chapter 2, when we read that then the secret was revealed to Daniel in a night vision, and Daniel blessed the God of heaven. We also talked about how wonderful, this, this, uh, how wonderful Daniel's prayer was this here. Daniel discloses an amazing comprehension of the nature of God in his prayer. He talks about the power, the power of God and the wisdom of God and his ability to reveal secrets and to answer prayers of Daniel and his friends. Here is possibly one of the most beautiful phrase, uh, uh, praises recorded in all of the Bible. Many, many have said that. As Daniel gives thanks to God for answered prayer. My friends, answered prayer and praying is probably one of the most powerful weapons that is a child of God that we have here this morning. I'd like us to keep that in mind. And we can certainly see that in the life of Daniel. Then we, we started and we see how that day broke and Daniel sought out uh, Arioch. Daniel requested to be brought before the king, as we saw in, chapter, in, in verse 24 of chapter 2. And Daniel reveals the, the dream to, uh, the, the, at, this point, at, at this point, Daniel's going to reveal the, the, the dream to King Nebuchadnezzar. <coughs> Excuse me. But before he does, he wants to make sure that, that Nebuchadnezzar understands that it is the, that it is the true God that has given him the dream, that this, this specific dream, and that it is God that is now going to reveal it to him as well. He, did, he also wants to make sure that he distinguishes himself from all these other wise men, that he's not associated with them, it's not their gods, doesn't have anything to do with, with anything that they're all about, but that he is distinct and different, okay, because he represents the true God. And he says to the king, cannot the wise men... He wants to expose them for the imposters that they are, as well as their false gods and that, they, that they claim to represent. 
In verse 27 we read, And Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, The secrets which the king hath demanded, cannot the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, the soothsayers, <clears throat> show unto the king? In this statement to Nebuchadnezzar, Daniel was preparing the way for a testimony to Nebuchadnezzar. That was what this was about. He wanted to be sure that Nebuchadnezzar understood the greatness of his God. The greatness of the only true God of heaven. Thus making the point that the true God was greater than their gods, which are truly no gods. At best they were demons. And not only is he the true God, but he is the only God. Now Daniel wants to make sure that he clarifies the origin of this interpretation. He wants to be sure the king understands that this is God that's given it to him. It's God that's going to reveal it to him. It's not him. Daniel makes clear that this interpretation also was not by any normal wisdom of any man. No man could ever have done this. But was simply was supernatural. And it come directly from Daniel's God. Now please look at verse 31 with me in chapter 2. As Daniel reveals the dream. Daniel begins, he says, Thou, O king, sawest, and behold a great image. This great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. The image's head was of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay, and break them in pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together, and became like the shaft of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away, and no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain, and filled the whole earth. This is the dream, and I will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. What Nebuchadnezzar had seen in his dream was a colossus image, of, in, 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 basically in human form. It was, a, it was both terrible and dreadful, beautiful and majestic all at the same time. It shined forth in its countenance. And it truly, it was very, very impressive. And I think by this time we can say that Nebuchadnezzar was fascinated and awed by, by Daniel, by this young by this very, very young man or even young teenager at this point that was able to do what nobody else, none of these other great men in the, in, the, uh, uh, in, the, in the empire could do for him, he was able to do. Now we're going to look at the interpretation of, Neb of Nebuchadnezzar's dream. If you'll look at uh, verses 36 with me. Daniel goes on to say here, he says, This is the dream, and we will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. Thou, O king, art a king of kings, for the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power, and strength, and glory. And wheresoever the children of the men dwell, the beasts of the field, and the fowls of heaven, hath he given into thy hand, and have made thee ruler over all of them. Thou art this head of gold. And after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee, and another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over thee, over all the earth. And a fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdue all things, and as iron, as, and as iron that breaketh all these, shall it break in pieces and bruise. And whereas thou sawest the feet and the toe, part of potter's clay and part of clay, the kingdom shall be divided. But there shall be in it of the strength of the iron, for as much as thou sawest, the iron mixed with miry clay. And as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. And whereas thou saw, sawest the iron mixed with, with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. But they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. In the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. 
For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God had made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter. And the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof sure. We see that Babylon is the head of gold. Daniel begins the interpretation by pointing out that the head of gold represents Nebuchadnezzar. We saw that it was thou, O king, art. So the thou there is, of course, it's Nebuchadnezzar. And also the Babylonian empire. Looking at verse 36 again through 38, we see this is the dream that Daniel says. This is the dream. And we will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. Thou, O king, art the king of kings. For the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power, and strength, and glory. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field, and the fowl of heaven, hath he given into thy hand, and have made thee ruler over all of them. Thou art the head of gold. You know, although Nebuchadnezzar had not really reigned over the entire earth, from a stand, but I believe from that standpoint, when we look at Nebuchadnezzar, his kingdom was actually the smallest of all of them that are represented here, all four kingdoms. But what we know, and I believe is, is that we see that he reigned over all of the world as far as what would seem relevant to him in his day and in the age that he was in. All that he really felt was necessary to really have. However, though, I think if we think about it, although Babylon was the smallest of all the prophetic uh, nations, but based upon the scriptures as we see it here, what we just looked at, he could have gone on and subdued the whole world if it would have been his uh, desire to do so. You see, the right to rule extended, it didn't only extend to men for him, but God had also extended to the beasts of the field and the fowl of, and the fowl of heaven. Nebuchadnezzar, <clears throat> Nebuchadnezzar was the greatest of all Gentile kings. And then we look and we see next the, the next empires that we see are the Mede and the Persians and the Greek and the Medes and the Persians and the Greek are the next two world empires. Now it's interesting to note there's only one short verse here and it covers both of these two empires. That's verse 39. When it says, After these shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee and another third kingdom of brass which shall bear rule over the earth. Now we know that these kingdoms, the first one is represented by his breast and arms of silver. We see the second one is his belly and, and thighs of brass. We learn later as we look at chapter 7 and 8 that, the, that, that, that this is speaking about the Medes and the Persians. When it speaks about the brass of his, of his, of his, his breast and his arms of silver. And the Grecian Empire is represented by his belly and his thighs of brass, of, of, of brass or bronze. Now, in Daniel chapter 8 and in verse 20, we get, we, we, at this point in time, the names are revealed of these, of these, two, of these two future uh, kingdoms at that time. In verse 20 it says, The ram which thou sawest, having two horns, are the kings of the Medes and the Persians. And the rough the rough goat is the king of Grecia, and the great horn that is between his eyes is the first king. Now, the fourth kingdom, the final world, the final world empire, at least of the Gentile world, is Rome. In chapters 2 as well as in chapter 7, major attention is given to this fourth, in, for, to this fourth empire, which though not identified in the book of Daniel, it is clearly the, the empire of Rome. Of course, it succeeds the Grecian Empire, which would have been the, the, third, the third kingdom, and is represented in Nebuchadnezzar's vision by the legs of iron and the feet of iron and baked clay. You know, the, the Roman Empire grew so large, and it covered most of Europe and actually North, of, uh, North Africa and even parts of Asia. And thus it became necessary to actually divide it. It take them Weeks and weeks and weeks to get a message across one way, and weeks and weeks and weeks to get it back the other. It was getting in, totally unmanageable to do. So they divided it up, which we'll see, into the, Western, uh, into the Western Roman Empire and then the Eastern Roman Empire. What's significant here is that these two, that these two different ones at this point, I believe, represent the two legs. We have two different legs on this, on this particular fourth empire of iron. 
Now look at verse 40 with me, if you would, in chapter 2. And it says, In the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces, and to do all things, and as iron that breaketh all things, shall it break in pieces and bruise. And whereas thou sawest the feet and the toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. But there shall be in it of, of, of the strength of the iron. For as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay, and as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. And whereas thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. I believe the Roman Empire fulfills this description. And it also, we'll see uh, even, even more so as we get into looking at it in, in chapter 7 as well, we'll see even more of it come, to, uh, come into view, which will help us to actually see how, how, uh, how exacting this, uh, this description is of, of Rome itself. You know, in verse 43, the scene is prophetically pretty much true of what Christ would have seen in his day. By the time that Christ was on the scene, when he, when he comes into the world, at that time, Babylon had already basically come and gone. The, uh, the uh, Medes and the Purge had basically come and gone, and also had the Grecian Empire. It had come and gone. Now it was the time of that fourth empire, which is where our Lord and Savior is in his ministry. Daniel goes on, however, to reveal that the time when the kingdom would be destroyed, would be destroyed, but it would be destroyed this time by a fifth kingdom, not related, please, not related to the Gentile kingdoms. This is a separate kingdom. Where does this kingdom come from? Well, it comes from heaven. Look, notice in, in, in verse 44 what the Bible says. It says, In the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. But it shall break in pieces and consume all the kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it break in pieces, the iron, the brass, the clay, and the silver and the gold, the great God had made known of, of the king what, what shall come to pass hereafter. And the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof sure. You know, it's interesting to note too, I want you to think about this. We talked about how those other kingdoms, we saw how they came and go, the, Gen the Gentile kingdoms, up until the Roman Empire. But in the image of Nebuchadnezzar, that when the image that's destroyed is all at once. It's all four kingdoms are going to get destroyed all at the same time. And I think that's going to be significant as we look in our study. Thus suggesting that the last empire will literally consume all four of these, in, uh, all four of these uh, kingdoms. And what is revealed, again, we want to remember the things that are going to come to pass. And I want you to think about this. The Word of God makes it clear too when He says this. God, uh, the Word of God says, the dream is certain. What does certain mean? It means it's absolute. It's not going to change. These things that God has talked about that he's revealing to Nebuchadnezzar, these are things that are going to be fulfilled, as just as he's saying. And he says the, interpret the, the interpretation thereof is sure. It's absolute. So these things are non-changeable. No prayer, no one's going to change it. God is going to do exactly what he says here, and this is going to be the history of the Gentiles, and it's going to be the history of the Jews, and we're talking about the kingdom that God is going to literally himself come in and set up. That too is going to be absolute. Now the stone or the rock described here is one that was not cut out with human hands. And that is, it was prepared by God Himself. Who is the stone? Well, we know the stone it can be described as, as Christ, as it, as it is in one or two places in Scripture. But it's Christ itself. We notice that it strikes the, the image of the feet. And it shatters, boom, shatters all the iron and the clay of the feet and results in the whole image being completely disintegrated. Remember, it becomes as the shaft of the threshing floors. It just turns the dust into just so small particles, it's blown in the wind. There's no way to find it or do anything. And this fulfills the description of Daniel, given in, in uh, Daniel uh, 2.35. Remember what we read when we were looking at this part of the Scripture, 
when it said, Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, the gold, broken to pieces together, and became like the shaft of the summer threshing floors, and the wind carried them away, and no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Yes, when our Lord comes and sets up His kingdom, it's going to fill the whole earth. Now, we can look and we can think today of all of these different empires that were there before. The first two empires, we don't have too, too much trouble understanding that, what, that they're even around today. We think about, we think about the Grecian Empire, we think about the Medo-Persian or the Persian Empire, still, are still around today. But what about Babylon? Well, the Bible, in Bible prophecy, it's quite clear that there will be an actual Babylon on the plains of, of, of Shinar in the end times. And that, of course, that, that today is modern Iraq. Now, most of us know that Saddam Hussein was actually trying to, many people don't know, but was trying to kind of quietly rebuild Babylon. I remember hearing a little bit about that back then, but he was actually trying to do this. But this city is, will become the headquarters for the, for the end time world system led by the beast, the Antichrist and his kingdom that will rule the world. And that's going to be somewhat biblical. Then, then the fifth kingdom, the final kingdom, is where God will come and set up his eternal kingdom. In, in, in verse 44 in Daniel chapter 2, we read, In the end the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all the kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. For as much as thou saw that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, and the silver, and the gold, the great God have made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter, and the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof sure. Of course, we know that rock is Christ that destroys it, as referred to in this fifth kingdom. We also see it's going to fill the whole earth. That's the millennial kingdom. It's the kingdom of God is going to set up forever and ever. Daniel tells us that the king, that, uh, that uh, Daniel, Daniel tells the king that there will be an end to all of these empires. Now, you can think about this just a minute. In a sense, most of men would not have told a king, number one, that his empire was going to come to an end, and number two, that all the Gentiles' empire would come to an end, for fear that that probably wouldn't set too well with the king. But Daniel was a man of God. He trusted God. He was going to tell him what, what, whatever it was. He did not fear man. We should have the same kind of constitution about ourselves, or same kind of uh, faith that we have in our God, uh, in, in our life, uh, how we walk with God as well. We see this. He pointed out how there was going to be no place even left for him when he got done, as we saw as the shaft. In the end, it's going to be man's mightiest and in his greatest estate versus the might of God's kingdom. You know something? Man's great estate and his great might are going to be destroyed. It's absolutely no match. God is God. He is all-powerful. And he's mighty. But you know something? He's the God of love. And he's the God of mercy. And his kingdom will be forever. It's going to be a righteous kingdom. A kingdom of righteousness. It's going to be a kingdom of indescribable beauty. And of unending wisdom and joy and peace. That will be lasting forever. It's a kingdom that we can't even begin to fathom. But God has let us see little bits and pieces of it. But we have it in his word what it's going to be. It's going to be apart from all human strength. All the chief subjects and all the visions as explained to Nebuchadnezzar. The images that he's seen standing in all of its part with all of it when the stone, when the stone struck. How it's all going to be destroyed. All that man thinks that he is and all, that he, all, all this might and strength that he has. But we also see it doesn't take much to see the horror, the corruption, the, the hate, the, 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 the dirt and the... And the and all that there is in the world. And all, all that all that all that goes in. And there's not, the world, his kingdom will have none of this in it. What a, what a deal it is to think about this. 
the final phase of the Gentile world power will embrace all of the features of Babylon, Persia, Greek, and the Roman Empire. It's going to be all of these that we just mentioned because I believe that image is it shows it complete. They're, when, the, when Rome comes back, and, and I'm going to suggest to you that Rome is going to do more than come back. It's going to be more of a reorganization. I believe Rome has really been there all along. But uh, there's different Bible people believe different things. But the point here that we're going to see is that uh, all of these kingdoms are going to come back. And they're, it's going to be part of, they're all going to be part of, this Roman, of, of, the, uh, of the Roman Empire. So we're going to see that for a, brief, for a brief period of time, the Antichrist will have control of the world. He is going to be the king of kings, as he always wanted to be. He's going to be the god of the world, as he insists on being worshipped as God and spoken to as God. The Antichrist, we want to remember, just as Nebuchadnezzar was the first king of the time of the Gentiles, the Antichrist is the last king of the time of the Gentiles when the, Lord, when, he, when the Lord comes and destroys the entire world. That's going to be done. Nebuchadnezzar the first, and, and of course the Antichrist is the last. Yes, this fifth empire is from heaven, and it's forever and ever, as we've seen from the Scriptures. And in those days, these kings... And in the days of these kings, the God of heaven shall set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom, the Roman kingdom, I think if we think about it, it'll take a few minutes, I'm not sure how much time we've got, but uh, just to take a look at this, this Roman kingdom, most, most think of it as revived Roman Empire, and it might be sort of coming like that. But Rome, if you really look at it throughout history, you won't ever find it where it was actually destroyed or where it was actually uh, we find a place in history where a battle happened and it was, and it was overrun or, or taken. It, it never really happens like that. It just sort of fades off. And there's a lot of things in the world that we can see that really speak pretty highly of it. We know, that about, we, we know some things about Rome. Rome ruled the world of its day with an iron hand. And it showed no mercy to, to rebels. Witnessed by the terrible the terrible doom and destruction in 70 A.D. of Jerusalem, which over they believe over a million people were killed during that time, over 600,000 taken captive, etc. And again in 135 A.D. against uh, Bar Akaba, uh, Akaba, uh, during, during that rebellion, another one all over again when Israel tried to rise back up and tried to redo it again. And although she was she ruled with cruelty. She's left an impression on the world in languages and laws and so many different areas that are permanently and still in with Western civilization. And some have suggested the empire ceased, uh, came to an end in, in 478. And some of the people that I was reading suggest that if that were true, then for the next thousand years, really, it comes impossible to really make sense of real history of what really happened. Unless you can really put it together I'm talking about having to do with the politics and the literature of that whole period. Unless, unless you can bear in mind that the ideas of the, the men of those days, for example, the Roman Emperor Augustus and Constantine and Justina, was, was not a thing of the past, but, ra but rather they were things of the present. It would seem then that the problem is not so much of the revival of the empire, but rather as a recasting or maybe even just a reorganization of that empire of a continuing spirit of power into itself, to the final ten, ten toe form. That's not a real important issue at this point, but it is something to kind of keep in mind. What is the issue is, is that the Roman Empire will come back into existence. It will be a power in the world. It will be the Antichrist that's going to seat at the head of it. And he's going to have ten confederated states that are underneath it. And he's going to be the ruler of the entire world at that time. That is, we, we know truly from the, uh, true from, uh, from the scriptures. So we see all of this. We know that the, 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 pro, we, we know that the period between the first coming of Christ and the second coming of Christ, you won't see in the Old Testament. We talked about that in our last study. You understand that uh, when Christ came into the world, that offer that he made of himself as the Messiah, if they would have received him, then the kingdom would have come in at that time. 
but they rejected him. Now, that's not disclosed in the Old Testament. And if, they, if it had been, then they, you could have honestly said at that time, well, Lord, it doesn't make any difference because you've got to come again before we're going to do all this. But it wasn't. It was a legitimate offer that the Lord had. But, of course, he knew that he was going to be rejected. He knew all that all along. So as we look at Old Testament prophecy, we need to realize that. But we're looking at only, they only look at Christ is coming. They don't know about the two different ones. Nor do they know that what's going to necessarily happen preceding his coming. For example, we think of the tribulation and some of the issues like that. And so we want to keep those in mind. But I did want to close out with these final verses here this morning. We find this. Daniel's promoted. Look at those final verses in this chapter. Verses 46. It says, Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell upon his face and worshipped Daniel. Now this is the king of king of everybody. I mean, he is the uno uno of the world. Most powerful man in the world now at this point in time. He can say, your head's off and you're, you're, and you're done. You know, he has all of this power. And you can see that he falls down and worships Daniel as a God because in his mind, Daniel just did what gods can only do. It's an amazing thing to see this and commanded that he should, that, that he should offer up an, an obligation and a sweet odorous unto, unto him. That's what they did with their gods. They offered up these things to their gods. That's what he suggested here at this point or wanted to see. Then the king answered unto Daniel and said, Of a truth it is that your God is a God of gods and a Lord of kings. He recognized it here. He's going to forget a little later on as we get into the scripture. Things are going to come back to it. But he forgets it here. And a revealer of secrets, seeing thou couldest, that thou couldldst reveal this secret. Nebuchadnezzar obviously acknowledges that Daniel's God is God and is the God of gods and is the Lord of all kings. And then we see in verse 48, Then the king made Daniel a great man and gave him many great gifts and made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief of the governors over all the wise men of Babylon. This teenager or very, very young man now becomes the second in command of all. He is the one that is right there by the side of Nebuchadnezzar. All of those wise men that thought they were so powerful that, 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 are, uh, that have been the leaders and all so much out there, he is above all of them. But notice what, what Daniel goes on to do. He doesn't just think of how great this is. Oh, how wonderful. Look at, look at, look at the position that I now have in the world. I am a great man. He doesn't do that. Then Daniel does this. Instead, he requests of the king. He says, and he said, uh, he, then Daniel requests of the king, and he set Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the provinces of Babylon. But Daniel, notice please, sat in the gate of the king. He was the king's most, most, uh, most noted advisor there at this point in time. But you see, he never forgot his friends. He brought them right along with him, alongside. I think when we, some actually think that Daniel actually wrote Psalm 119. We all love that psalm. It's the one that goes over the, the Word of God, the Word of God, the promises, the, 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 just who God is, and all so much of the Word of God. I think from that, as we see in that explicit poem, we can certainly say that Daniel lived it if he didn't write it. Daniel lived with implicit trust in God's Word, a place that it held in his heart all of his time that we read in the whole book of Daniel. He faces persecution and opposition in life, it may not be the kind that we typically face. The problem with advancement might be different than that that comes with adversity. But they are equally in trying the child of God. And we can see these were really big trials. Any one of these things could have gone a different way. Except that he knew that God was in control. And whichever way it went, it was a victory for him. And he trusted in God. You and I should do the same. Let us close here this morning. Father, we just thank you for this time. We thank you for your word. And Father, we ask you to help us to be more in tune to your leading and guiding in our life. And that, Father, we would lean fully upon you in all that we face every day in this world. And know, Lord, that you're more than sufficient to meet each need. And that you never forsake us nor forget us. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.